Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Angelos Athanasopoulos. I'm a journalist. Uh, this is um, a series of dialogue uh, of dialogues for the Greek Chairmanship for the Council of Europe. Uh, I have the honor to uh, have today with us one of the most famous intellects and philosophers and writers uh, of Europe, Mr. Bernard Levy, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, before, before I start our conversation, I would like to, uh, to give the stand to uh, Mr. Miltiadis Barbiciotis, who is the alternate Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, on Europe. Uh, he's going to make some introductory remarks and then we will start our dialogue. So, uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Minister. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, bonsoir, uh, cher uh, Bernard. C'est un plaisir que tu es avec nous uh, ce soir. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to, to this uh, second round of this in discussion with uh, cycle that we have in the framework of our chairmanship in the Council of Europe. The aim is to highlight the important aspects of the sanitary crisis and to find answers to the many questions uh, regarding this uh, pandemic. You know that uh, in our first interview we had uh, uh, Professor Dimitris Tsiodras, who was uh, the spokesman of the Greek uh, Ministry of Health uh, for the pandemic. And now it's a great pleasure to host uh, Bernard uh, uh, Henri Levy, who has been uh, very active in producing, apart from what he has produced already, a series of interventions regarding uh, this pandemic and the reaction to this pandemic. You know that uh, throughout his visits and throughout his writings, he claimed things that uh, we find extremely important and we want to highlight within the framework of our chairmanship. The one is that this pandemic should not be an excuse to close our door to the world, which is very important. We want to keep our open societies and we want to keep our economies as well open. The other one is that we shouldn't lower our human rights standards in order to safeguard an illusion that we are not ever going to die. But uh, nevertheless, for us, that we have decided to put uh, health first and we have decided to put human lives above everything and all, uh, and we try to, de to do it with respect of the rule of law, of democracy and the human rights, it's very important to understand that it's not the case for all the countries in the world. So I am really eager to, to listen to this conversation. Uh, I would uh, like to thank a lot uh, our friend uh, Bernard for being uh, digitally uh, with us here. Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't make these uh, conversations live, but I think that uh, through this uh, initiative that we took to transform our chairmanship in a neat chairmanship and to use all these teleconferences to address a greater audience that can be accumulated in a, in a room, uh, it is important to send a message that uh, we in Europe, we discuss and we try to promote what is a new vision for the world, that the world can fight and deal with the pandemic, but we can deal, uh, can deal uh, with uh, respect of human rights, respect of rule of law, respect of democracy. At the end of this series of events, we are uh, wishing that uh, we finally formulate a document and have a declaration on behalf of the Council of Europe that deals with a specific issue in order for the future generations to have a guideline of how to deal with these kind of challenges that I hope it's going to be the last one, but the history proves the opposite. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Dear Angelos, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your uh, thoughtful uh, remarks and intervention. Um, Mr. Levy, I would like to seize from uh, what the Minister said uh, just now. Uh, we are out of the lockdown, uh, but the pandemic is still with us, even not in Europe, in other parts of the world. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, 
uh, if you think that COVID-19 is a transformational uh, event for the world, um, what will its main repercussions and impact will be for politics, economics, and society uh, when finally uh, COVID is not, is not with us? And if you think that uh, in Europe uh, we overdid it with uh, the lockdown and the restraints in, uh, in moving, uh, going out of their houses, maybe we stayed too much in our houses, do you believe that this affected the economies too much? What do you think? First of all, I want to, to tell you that I'm happy to be with you. I'm happy to, to meet again your minister, Milciad, uh, who I, whom I know already, and he is a great minister. And um, I'm, uh, I love Greece. I love to be in Athens. I'm uh, fed with Greek culture. Um, Greek culture is in my 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 fibers and my and my body and my and my soul. I'm very happy to have this conversation. Uh, I must say that you you dealt in Greece uh, with this crisis rather well. Uh, it was very difficult. It was an improvisation for everyone. It was an unknown territory in which we were all entering um, with no precedent, uh, no preparations, uh, no preconceived rules. And I must say that Greece did rather well in, uh, in the way of closing, in the way of, uh, of uh, reopening. Uh, what I can say is my anxiety for the future, is my fear. My worst fear is that um, some, there are some habits, some tendencies of our societies which were already existing before the crisis of COVID. And my fear is that they could be accelerated by the crisis. For example, the, the power, the, what we are doing now, the non-contact, the presence without presence, uh, the habit to speak live, but without uh, hugging, without looking at each other face to face. This is okay for a moment. It is probably, it was necessary, maybe it is still necessary. What would be dramatic is, would be, if at the end of the day we said, okay, it's good. It spares some uh, uh, kerosene, uh, is good for the climate, and it's as well. I think it will be a disaster. Nothing replaces the physical contact. Shaking hands uh, in Paris, like in Greece, when uh, there is a problem with, uh, as you know, uh, shaking hands. For a moment, okay, probably necessary. If it had to last, it would be a disaster. The gesture of shaking hands is a gesture of civilization, of civility, of brotherhood. It means something in the relationship between uh, two people. Uh, the mask. I was in Athens recently and I saw uh, an hesitation uh, in the streets of Athens, those who wear a mask, those who did not. I like this hesitation because, again, if we had to enter in a, in a world where Greek or Paris or French citizens took the habit for hygienic reasons to wear a mask all the time, it would be again a U-turn in our conception of ethics. Ethics means relationship between two bare, uh, nude, naked uh, faces. This is uh, the basis in all the wisdoms, Greek wisdom, Latin wisdom, Jewish wisdom, Christian wisdom. The face-to-face -face of uh, two looks are crucial in ethics. So there are some gestures which we have been compelled to invent during this crisis. My wish is that they don't remain as a too long in heritage. You mentioned uh, different accelerating trends. So I would like to take you to what happened to some countries like Hungary, uh, where we have seen that the state actually took advantage of um, COVID in order to introduce some kind of legislation. And uh, we didn't see this only in Hungary. It's just an example widely commented all over Europe. Uh, are you afraid that these liberal tactics 
uh, could be accelerated even more in the next uh, few years? What is happening in Hungary, in Hungary is really sad. Uh, I know Viktor Orban. I met him first uh, in the very beginning of the 90s, just after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. I, I saw him again a few months ago, which means 30 years after. And it's so sad that the young, vibrant liberal of, the, of 30 years ago has become this illiberal um, semi-autocrat who he is now. This is a sad story in Hungary, which is the, one of the beating hearts of Europe. And what is uh, sad is that, of course, he took advantage of this moment of this crisis, of the fact that the rest of Europe had the eyes uh, focused on COVID to take, to make some steps, to take some decision, which uh, uh, is equal to a sort of etern of a long run state of emergency, uh, able to ban some parties whom he does not like, able to close some NGO which does not please him, uh, and so on and so on. So there is a new, uh, an acceleration in the shaping of this illiberal democratic model of society, which means democracy without democracy, democracy reduced to the act of voting. Uh, Mr. Orban, as a few others, they are inventing that. A democracy which is reduced to the fact of giving the last word to the people. But we know, you know in Greece more than anyone, that democracy is more than that. A democracy is the conception of the city, is the conception of the agora, is a, 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 a way of acting. In the world. So this is one of the side effects of the virus. While we all were occupied, busy, with the virus. At the moment when all our t uh, TV news were, were uh, triple size, but speaking only of virus and virus and virus, Mr. Orban made these steps without any uh, ultimatum, without any protest, without any warning of his partners. I hope that now, uh, when the pandemic is uh, going a little further, time will come for his partners to tell him, okay, you have to choose. You cannot have, as we say in French, the butter and the money of the butter. You have to choose to be in Europe, but accept accepting the values of Europe or having your own values. And then you will have to step out and to to go wherever. And maybe, maybe to those whom the Hungarian people wanted to escape, which is Putin, for example. Uh, you've been uh, a staunch supporter of uh, human rights since your uh, very early days. Um, I was reading, uh, before I do this uh, interview with you, this discussion uh, about what you did in Bangladesh in the 70s. So you've been, you always had uh, an affection for the weak. Uh, so um, uh, I, I suppose you agree with me that Europe has not treated um, so well the refugees or as, as well as the, uh, Europe should have treated them. Uh, I also know that uh, you, you visited uh, Moria recently, so you've seen with your own eyes what is going on there. Do you think that uh, COVID worked against uh, the refugees? Do you think that uh, maybe it's an opportunity um, to give them better conditions in the way they live? How do you think we should pro proceed from now on as far as also Europe is thinking of ways for a new uh, migration pact in order to, to open up to refugees? I was in Moria recently uh, for the second time. I was one first in March before the crisis, just before February, and I was two weeks ago. And you will have my story about Moria, I think, in one of your daily newspapers in Greece in the next days. It was published already in France. In America, it will be in Greece. I have two things to say, two things, one about Greece and one about Europe. 
about Greece, uh, no, COVID was not an opportunity to deal in a better way with the migrants of Moria. It was the opposite. The COVID crisis has been apparently an opportunity, an occasion to close the camp, to lock it, to lock it up, to, to lock, to lock it, to, to lock it down completely. You have there 20, 19,000 people who are getting, getting nearly crazy with this complete uh, closing. Though there is very, very little, if not known, case of COVID inside the camp. I must tell you that I came myself with 1,000 masks to offer to the, to, the, to the people of the camp, which I did. At the end of my distribution, I discovered that the children were playing with the mask as carnival games, but they don't have any COVID case. So it was a, it has been an, a, a pretext to close even more tightly the camp. Now I have something to say about Europe. Uh, the case of Moria, the burden of Moria should not be the burden of Greece. It should be a, a, a burden or an opportunity or at least a duty for all Europe. In the story you, you will read, in a Greek newspaper soon, you will see that I end with a concrete idea. These 19,000 people of Moria have to be uh, spread inside the 27 countries composing the, uh, um, uh, the Union, European Union. It is a moral and a political duty. It is nothing. 19,000 compared to 500 million of Europeans, it's a joke in terms of number. And Moria has not to be arranged or rebuilt, it has to be suppressed, erased. We have to, my opinion, I addressed this message to Chancellor Merkel, to President Macron, and to other leaders of Europe. The migrants of Moria should go now in the other countries other than Greece and the Moria camp, which is a dishonor for all of us. This camp, uh, pr which was scheduled for 2,000 2, or 3,000 people and which is occupied by 20,000 people, is a shame for all of us, all of us, not Greece, Greece and Europe. This shame has to be repaired and it is our common duty. And this article, will circulate, I hope, in all Europe in order to convey this message. COVID or not COVID. So, um, you wrote a book a few years ago, um, The Empire and the Five Kings, and um, you actually warned in it about the risks of uh, a United States um, a withdrawal from, uh, from global affairs. Um, would you say that COVID-19 is accelerating this trend? Do you, do you think that the pandemic could be disruptive for the uh, international system as we've, uh, we've seen it uh, since 1989? I think so, yes. Uh, it is, again, it is an old trend. Even regarding America, it is not only Trump. Donald Trump, of course, accelerated the process. COVID accelerated even more, but it is older than that. It started maybe with Barack Obama, maybe even earlier, this way of America stepping out uh, the rest of the world. Uh, the concrete result is that when democracies step out, uh, barricade themselves in their own borders, uh, decide to look inside only the bad guys who are Putin, Xi Jinping, uh, Erdogan, uh, Iranians, uh, Mr. Khamenei in uh, Lebanon or in Syria are proceeding. The, the point is that nature hates emptiness and political nature same, hates emptiness. And when Donald Trump says America first, when uh, European nations say Europe first, 
We close our Schengen borders. We don't, uh, the problem of the rest of the world, we have enough to deal with our problems. These guys who don't care with human life, we don't care, who don't care with uh, uh, rights, they proceed and they occupy the emptiness. And this is exactly the situation in which we are. I, I, I uh, foresaw it. I announced that two years ago in this book, the Empire, America, and the five kings, radical Islam, Iran, Turkey, Russia, and China proceeding. It is exactly what happens with the COVID and after the COVID. And this is, a, if we let this movement go to reach its end, it will be a disaster for the civilization which you Greeks invented 2,500 years ago and for the rest of, of Europe and for the West. Do you think that China, who is actually uh, one of um, the, five, uh, the five kings who are actually uh, look to take, to grab the United States role, do you think that it will be accepted as a global hegemon? I mean, do you think that this could happen? Or uh, the Chinese model looks not so attractive? My friend, uh, if you had asked me this question three months ago, four months ago, I would have laughed like you. I would have said no way. <laughs> no European well articulated and normally <laughs> articulated could accept the Chinese model. Today, let's look at what happens. In the international institution like OMS, the Health World Organization, which was invented by the West, invented by partly America. America is retreating, receding, and Chinese, Chinese are occupying the, the stage and the place and the seat. It's already done. And you have other institutions which are in this case. China is replacing America. If you look at the, um, the model um, of testing, tracing, and isolating the virus, in French, we have that which is stop COVID. This idea that uh, we will have, uh, we have already a program which is set, which is uh, uh, embedded in our telephone, uh, encrypted in our telephone and which allows to um, uh, An Angel's Brigade to trace our movement, to look at our contact and so on. This is exactly the Chinese model. I'm sorry. It is exactly what was uh, presented a few months ago as a, big, uh, uh, as a funny uh, 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 re remote impossible model of society and we were laughing not us chinese okay asiatic model why not european are too sharp to accept to have a little spy in their telephone honestly today we are already we not me but there are some millions of european who are trying who are accepting and who are entering in the trick uh, recently, a few weeks ago, a few days ago, I was in Roma. I was in, in the airport of Roma. And my, my temperature was taken by a, a remote camera. We accept that a machine, a robot, can check our health, can be aware before myself of today it is COVID. Okay, very con great contamination possible. I, I agree. Tomorrow it will be something else. The camera will detect an illness which I am not aware of. Maybe I'm aware, but I don't want my wife to or my family to be aware. You know, this transparency, this sort of new social contract based on the idea of sanitarism, hygienism, this is a Chinese model, which is slowly but surely imposing his laws reasonably in all Europe. So we have to be very careful of that too. You also touched upon the 
uh, the, the end of privacy, which is uh, actually a, a big issue for uh, for all of us. So, uh, however, it seems that the European Union is uh, slowly understanding that China, uh, I wouldn't say it's a threat, but it's definitely a systemic rival. So we've seen this in the last few days. Um, um, you also followed uh, the discussion in the EU about a new recovery fund, and France played a crucial role in uh, pushing this through. I, I wonder if you see that the European Union can actually take advantage of COVID and maybe um, become more of a global power. I know that France uh, feels about power much different than many other uh, EU countries like Germany, and uh, the strategic uh, uh, the strategic brain. Uh, in France is, is totally different. Do you see that the EU can actually become uh, more of a global power? Maybe not a military one, but... It has to. Not it can. It has to. In the current state of the world, with America disappearing from the stage, or appearing but in a new way, maybe America understood that it is unnecessary to have a military presence if you have Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Maybe maybe there is um, an implicit calculation that the real power goes through the GAFAM and does not need any longer old uh, political presence. Maybe. I think things do not work like this and that... Uh, old history continues. So anyway, America retreats. If Europe is not able to take its destiny in hands, if we are not able, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, to, to make some sacrifices of sovereignty in order to build a real power, it will be a disaster the world will be ruled by, in one generation, even before, by what I call the five kings, the five I quoted before, radical Islam, Shia Islam of Iran, uh, Turkey, o o o old Ottoman Empire revived and resuscitated, uh, 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 Russian imperialism and Chinese Empire. So it is a must. We must. About privacy, one word. Privacy is more than important. I really believe that the freedom of a human being depends on the quantity of privacy that remains in his hands. The more you have privacy, the more you think, the, the more you think, and the more you are free. The, le the least privacy remains in your fingers, the least privacy the least you 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 think less and you are and you are less free there is a real mechanical relationship between your quantity of secrets and the quality of your thought and the quality of your liberty it's a law inscribed in human nature i could prove it by greek ancient philosophy by all Judeo-Christian wisdom, the more secrets you have, you detain, the more free and the more thoughtful you are. With, with the danger of being provocative, I would like to ask you, what, what is your biggest fear? Uh, COVID or Donald Trump being re-elected? Donald Trump being re-elected. Why is that? Uh, because with, the, with Donald Trump, we will have COVID plus Trump. We will have both. We will have COVID because he denies the COVID. And we will have Trump, which is a disaster for America and a di disaster for the world. But it will be double penalty. With Trump, it will be double penalty. So I'm so, afraid of both. Um, I, I would consider you a, a liberal interventionist, uh, by the way, you have been a proponent of um, uh, the Bosnian war and even uh, toppling Gaddafi in Libya and all this. Um, 
how do you respond to the people who say that uh, it was better with Gaddafi? Uh, at least we had stability and um, maybe it was even better with Assad. Uh, leave Assad in his place. Uh, better an Arab winter than an Arab spring, which is actually much uh, shorter. Uh, how do you judge the, the result, the, the, the impact of the intervention? There are many questions in your question. Uh, to know if it is better be with Assad or be without Assad, with Qadhafi or without Qadhafi, is not your point or my point. It is the point of the inhabitants of the country. Apparently, they think that it is it would be better without Assad and that it was better without Qadhafi. And in fact, they are killed in Syria. They did not succeed killed by millions, millions of refugees, uh, destabilization of all area, and so on and so on. Our uh, uh, responsibility is another one. At the moment where, when a people wants to liberate himself from a dictator, the decision we have to make is, do we have the right to prevent him and to lock the chains? Or do we have the duty to help him, the people, as much as we can? Now there is a second question. If we decide to help to unlock the chains, uh, shall we do it just for five minutes and looking elsewhere after? Or do we have a duty of continuation? I believe that. And I believe that in Libya, the mistake is that after the toppling of Gaddafi, the West, and France should have continued to care, should have uh, continued to 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 uh, to help to nation build, which we do, which we did not do. But as a principle, there is no question: when a people wants to topple one of the worst dictatorship in the world. I believe that our duty is to help. When a dictator launches a war against its, his own people, because this is the case in Syria today, we have the duty as much as we can as try, trying to stop the war. To stop the war. I, I've, I've never been favorable to a war. Uh, even in Bosnia, I did not plead for the war. I always plead for peace, for stopping the war. When the Serbs bombed Sarajevo, my idea that was that we had to stop the Serbs. When Gaddafi bombed uh, uh, Benghazi, my idea that it was that we had to stop Gaddafi. And since uh, nine years, uh, Assad is bombing, torturing, gassing his people, I, making war to his own people. It is not a civil war. It is a war against by a tyrant against the civilians. We we should stop help stopping this war. Yes, of course. Um, what is the magic trick if we want to to stop these wars? I mean, we uh, Libya is all over the headlines these days. Uh, I suppose you follow it very closely. It's of high interest for France too. Uh, especially since uh, Turkey has actually uh, intervened pretty forcefully in Libya. Uh, so how do you think that France and, and Europe more general can actually help? I think that uh, for, Lib for Libya and for Libyan people, my problem is that Libya is Libyan people. It's not a good idea to be under the boot of uh, Putin and Erdogan. This is what is happening now. Putin and Erdogan are sharing Libya, Libya into two, uh, and uh, none of them, Putin and uh, Russia and uh, Turkey, are democratic countries. So for me, it's very sad and very heartbreaking. If Europe had more political existence, which we hope we will have, but we don't have this moment. Europe should should say no to this uh, demoniac uh, deal, to this pact with the devil. Uh, Libya is at the gates of uh, Europe. It's our uh, neighboring country in a, in a sense. We should have our word to say. And it is sad that we don't say. 
And President Macron this morning made a statement and said how concerning for him is the situation of Libya hijacked by both dictatorship, Erdogan and Putin. And one last question, just referring to, um, to this famous book of yours about the Empire and the Five Kings. Um, what was it that actually um, uh, um, led you to include Erdogan in the Five Kings? What, did, what was it that you have seen? What was the, uh, the, 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 what was the tricky part in his, was it his character? Was it the fact that he has a hidden agenda? Was it that he had a vision which you, it looked dangerous to Europe? What, what was it? He has an official agenda, not hidden, which is to rebuild the Ottoman Empire. It is his dream. He has a certain behavior regarding Europe, which is based on blackmail, blackmail with refugees and blackmail with terrorism. Erdogan had some sentences to German people who were borderline threat, threatening of terrorist acts if uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, took some unpleasant gesture toward uh, Turkey, uh, number two. And number three, what made me include Erdogan in the, in the list is his obsession with the Kurds, the Kurds who are uh, the allies of the West, who are one of the embodiments of the enlightened Islam of today, the Kurds who represent a chance for Islam of the future, who represent a possibility of reconciliation of Islam, piety with human rights, democracy, equality between women and men, etc. This possibility which Kurds embody is precisely what Erdogan hates, tries to crush, bombs, invades, and so on. The way he acted in Syria a few months ago. The way he acts uh, today in the Sinjar uh, mountains. Uh, by the way, bombing the rest of the Yezidi people by the, in the, in the same gesture, this uh, is absolutely a sorrow for me, a wound for those who are who love liberty and freedom, and a disaster for those who believe in dialogue of civilizations. If we believe that uh, the West uh, and the rest of the world um, uh, have to build bridges and links of brotherhood, the Kurdish people is one of these bridges, not Erdogan. And Erdogan is bombing the bridge. This is one, the last reason why, for me, he belongs to this club of autocrats who are trying to undermine the best of our civilization. Uh, my last question will be centered on human rights. As far as uh, we are now in an environment of human rights, Greek Chairmanship Council of Europe, uh, what you'd be, what it would be your main uh, motto, your main advice on how uh, the European Union can and the Council of Europe uh, can be an even stronger campaigner for human rights, both inside Europe and outside Europe. What Europe should do on human rights? What more she can do? The first thing we have to do is to, to be very severe with ourselves. It's very difficult to give advice to, or lessons to the rest of the world when we accept indoors, which means in Hungary, in uh, Slovakia, uh, in Poland, some illiberal tendencies. There is a real problem there. You have some countries in Europe who, who, who turn their back 
to the core of our DNA and of our inheritance. So first task, deal with that. Even if it has to lead to a crisis in Europe, I prefer a sharp crisis than this bleeding wound, which is the permanent dispute between those who believe in the European values are as Greeks, Germans, France, and those who, are, who don't believe in it. This has to be dealt with, number one. When this will be dealt with, then we will have the, the not only the duty, but the permission and the responsibility to express our concern to other places of the world. Because what the real founders of Europe said, I'm thinking, for example, of the philosopher Edmund Husserl in his very famous lecture in Prague and in Vienna in 1938, is that Europe is the embodiment of universality, that uh, there is not only a match between Europe and universality, but that it is the same, and that it is in the vocation of Europe to preach and to plead universal values to the rest of the world, and not only inside of the Schengen borders. Sir, uh, thank you ever so much. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you here uh, in this uh, discussion series of uh, the Greek Chairmanship of the Council of Europe. Um, I really hope we will see you again soon in Athens and in Greece and uh, we will be able, uh, COVID excluded, uh, to have uh, a discussion uh, face to face. Thank you so much. Hope so. Hope so. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Good evening. Thank, Thank you. you.